Was there an Adam? Was there an Eve? Or did we evolve from what we conceived? Either way, we got what we needed when the sun shone down on the Garden of Eden. We bit that apple and the garden was lost And so we had to work to pay the cost And so we went digging into the ground And started to burn many things we found But don't you know oh, yeah. we're gonna have a solar topia Started to burn too many things we found That's the wonderful Dora Williams singing with Pete Seeger, of course And uh, David Burns, the solar topia theme song uh, we have some good news and bad news today from Solartopia. Uh, a lot going on in the world. I'm uh, unfortunately have to report that the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant, which we've been talking about a lot on this show, has gone back online. But our efforts to get it inspected and get it shut will continue as they have for the last uh, 30 or 40 years. Uh, we're joined today by three truly great um, uh, experts in the nuclear power field. Uh, Jim Green from Australia. Jim, you with us? Yeah, good. I have you. Uh, good. Great. Uh, <laughs> good day, as they say in California. Um, just great to have you on with us, and um, it's a real honor. Uh, Paul Gunter, you with us? Yes. Hi, Harvey. Okay, great. Good to have you on, Paul. And uh, uh, Kevin, uh, Kevin Camps, you with us? Hello, Harvey. I'm here. Hey, how are you? Okay. So listen, um, I know, Paul, you're going to have to run, uh, but I do want to uh, talk uh, with Jim a bit about a big article he recently wrote on um, uh, the demise of small modular reactors. And I'm sure both you guys are going to want to hear this, Paul and, and Kevin. So, uh, uh, Jim, if you'll, if you'll tell us, please, what are you thinking on um, um, on small reactors? What's going on? Well, I think the, the main point is that the economics simply aren't going to work. And because the economics are unlikely to work, no one's prepared to invest any money in it. So the private sector won't invest. And they're lobbying furiously to get government grants and subsidies. But... Um, so far, those sort of subsidies are one or two orders of magnitude less than what's required to get uh, even a rudimentary uh, small modular reactor industry up and running. So I think it's basically dead at birth, this, small, this industry. And also, if you look at the handful of reactors under construction around the world, they're just ridiculously expensive. And surprise, surprise, they're behind schedule and they're well over budget. And all of this is looking fairly predictable. Well, um, who exactly is trying to um, uh, push ahead with new reactors? What's, where's the impetus coming from? Well, I mean, it's, uh, mostly it's coming from the nuclear industry, which has given up on big reactors because of disasters like the AP-1000s in the U.S., which have been so over budget and uh, cancelled in the case of South Carolina. Uh, but there's, I think one of the interesting things that comes out of this report is how interconnected this whole push for small reactors is with the military, and especially with the nuclear weapons complex. And in the US, that's really reached a, a low point because there are two projects which have uh, which have been okayed and approved. One is to reinitiate domestic uranium enrichment in the US, and the other is for a, a test reactor, a test fast neutron reactor. Um, now, both of those projects are being sold as being uh, necessary or important to, uh, to establish an industry for small modular reactors and other so-called advanced nuclear reactors, but... The truth of the matter is that both got very strong military origins and implications. 
And I think a really strong likelihood is that the way this plays out is that very few, if any, of these small reactors are ever built. But the promise of an industry for small modular reactors has justified and provided cover for military projects. So I think that's one of the most important and one of the most pernicious aspects of this whole debate. Well, um, uh, that, that's an interesting dimension here because we've had this come up in um, in the, the subsidy, uh, the handouts for Perry and Davis Bessies, um the um, uh, industry, at least uh, three uh, Congress people in Northern, Cal- Northern Ohio argued that one of the reasons that uh, Perry and Davis Bessie should be subsidized is because of their role in the nuclear weapons industry. Kevin Camps, do you want to comment on that? And then Paul? Yeah, well, Ernest Moniz, uh, President Obama's energy secretary, said the same thing a couple years ago, and it was kind of surprising in a sense because they've been denying or trying to deny a connection between atoms for peace and nuclear weapons for more than half a century. And all of a sudden, in their desperation for massive bailouts to keep the the big old nukes that are dangerously age-degraded going, they just trotted this one out, that uh, in order to maintain our nuclear weapons arsenal, we need those uh, nuclear engineering departments at American universities. We need the trained personnel, we need the know-how, we need all of that infrastructure. So finally, after all these decades, they told the truth. They are connected, and uh, that's all the more reason to shut down the uh, American nuclear power industry so that we can abolish the American nuclear weapons arsenal. Uh, Paul Gunter? Yeah, <clears throat> well, Sluggo, the thing is, is that... Um, uh, you know, I think that we're all aware that nuclear weapons and nuclear power are inextricably linked. Um, uranium is the currency uh, for both industries. Uh, so it's just, uh, these are just flip sides of the same coin. But from the very beginning, the uh, uh, nuclear um, industry and the federal government saw the uh, the marriage of U.S. industry and mi- the military complex, uh, when they originally, uh, even even before the the um, uh, Adams for Peace speech by Eisenhower uh, before the United Nations, the uh, um, Atomic Energy Commission was soliciting uh, a partnership with Monsanto, uh, Detroit Edison, a whole host of uh, U.S. Uh, uh, industry uh, corporations uh, to uh, es- essentially um, in the production of uh, plutonium for nuclear weapons, uh, they were going to. The, the idea was to use the um, uh, the the heat that was discharged from the production of weapons material to co-generate electricity, and um, you know that theme has run. All along, I mean, we we wound up with um, with an overabundance of nuclear weapons material, but even today, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which is the um, the uh, U.S. government's electric utility, um, they are responsible for providing um, tritium, uh, radioactive hydrogen. Uh, which which puts the H in the H bomb, and th- this tritium is being produced at um, at two TVA reactors, uh, one in um, uh, at uh, Watts Bar, and the other at Sequoia. So um, you know this theme has um, uh, essentially run you know the same course all through history. Yeah. Now, now, Jim Green, uh, thank you for that, Paul. Now, Jim Green in, in Australia, um, um, is it possible that some countries um, will want to use uh, small modular reactors in their nuclear weapons programs, even though there's no uh, economic incentive? Or is that just not something that's something that's not going to happen? Yeah, I think it's absolutely a, a risk and a serious risk. And probably the most important case study there is Saudi Arabia. 
you know, normally you have to look for signs and indications and hints and clues that a country might be interested in nuclear weapons, but you don't have to do that for Saudi Arabia because uh, the political leaders have said openly that they're interested in acquiring nuclear weapons and they're certainly going to do that depending on how things play out with Iran. Um, so there's, there's no doubt that there's a, an agenda there to either develop nuclear weapons or to develop the capability to produce nuclear weapons. And they're very interested in small modular reactors. So I think we can join the dots there. And also, if you just look at the, the physics and mechanics of the different reactor types, um, there's a history of, of research reactors, very small research reactors being used to produce material for weapons. And there's a history of power reactors being used to produce material for weapons. Um, but I think these small modular reactors, they could easily be the technology of choice for the proliferator because... They're a lot cheaper. Well, they're somewhat cheaper than uh, than gigawatt-scale nuclear power programs. Uh, they produce a lot more plutonium than small research reactors. So I think there could be a niche for small reactors uh, to be the technology of choice for for proliferators. Wow, uh, but in the but you, what you're saying now in this article you've written and, and Jim, um, I hesitate. You you got a tremendous. Um, resume and, and tremendous qualifications here, but um, uh, and I'm sure that uh, Paul and, and uh, Kevin are uh, familiar with the work, but tell us a bit uh, about who you are and where this article is um, so that people can look it up uh, when you've, you're, you're obituary for small modular reactors. Yeah, well, if anyone wants to find it, it's, uh, yeah, just look up a obituary for small modular reactors and uh, <laughs> find an article published in The Ecologist a couple of days ago. And also Nuclear Monitor, produced by Wise and NERS. Um, yeah, once again, you find it pretty quickly, I think. And the Nuclear Monitor has got about 15 articles, so covering everything from the economics, the history, the proliferation issues, and safety issues and the whole lot. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a long report, and we're hoping it'll be a useful resource for the next year or two. Well, Paul Gunter, are you seeing any um, interest? Um, um, I don't know if you've seen this article, uh, but it is a bit of a landmark piece. Um, uh, are, is there continuing interest among American utilities and reactor promoters in these small reactors? Oh, of course. Um the uh, but you know again these are uh, this is um, uh, an industry that uh, is big on promise and uh, a failure to deliver at this point uh, and that that's that was true for the large boiling water reactors we you know, our our reactor fleet is largely uh, light water reactors um, for boiling water reactor and pressurized water reactor. Um, it has, as you know, in your audience, uh, has, as it's following your program, has been an abysmal failure. It continues to um, uh, fall way short on its promise to deliver um, electricity um, by boiling water with the atom uh, because it's just the most expensive way, uh, the most expensive technology uh, you could conceive of to um, uh, generate electricity uh, by boiling water. Uh, it, it, the interest has always really been on um, uh, generating uh, uh, nuclear materials, uh, but uh, the same the same failure, uh, the failure to, to deliver um, on, uh, on on cost of construction and the time to completion. This this has been the death knell. Um, uh, for this industry uh, through many uh, of its uh, uh, re-image, re-imaging uh, where, um, uh, you know, they are uh, uneconomical and they're, it's dangerous. And this, is, this applies to the uh, uh, SMR fleet as well. Uh, only I think that uh, one of the – some of the uh, best proof around – uh, that's delivered in this ecologist article is that the uh, the uh, promise of SMRs is only going to exponentially grow that cost of construction with uh, ever more uncertainty on the time to deliver. Uh, but uh, again, that's 
um, the um, the risk of proliferation is going to be the real menace, um, and governments are driven to build this uh, SMR. It's not going to be, um, uh, you know, Bill Gates himself is now going before U.S. Congress with his hat in hand looking for a, a federal taxpayer bailout because he knows that <clears throat> it's not about subsidies. It's about an umbilical cord to taxpayers and ratepayers, uh, and that formula has never changed and it won't change with this technology. Kevin Camps? Well, I was interested in that point about Saudi Arabia and nuclear weapons proliferation. So just... Uh... From a personal perspective, we're engaged in a fight in New Mexico against Holtec International, New Jersey-based, and their local supporters out in New Mexico called the Eddie Lee Energy Alliance, uh, a group of municipalities in two counties, to store 173,000 metric tons of high-level radioactive waste from the commercial nuclear power industry in the United States. And wouldn't you know that the law firm representing Holtec is involved in the Saudi scandal. It's called Pillsbury, not the baked goods company, but a pro-nuclear corporate law firm here in Washington, D.C. And it just happens to turn out that the uh, senior vice president at Pillsbury, uh, Jeffrey Merrifield, a former Nuclear Regulatory Commission commissioner, has been lobbying the U.S. Congress to take constraints against nuclear weapons proliferation off of any U.S. Saudi nuclear commerce deal. So it just shows kind of the uh, the questionable corporate character of some of these players, including the Pillsbury law firm uh, that we're butting heads with right now on this New Mexico issue, that they would, you know, would lobby Congress to remove non-proliferation safeguards. And uh, one of my favorite quotes that really boils it down was from Brad Sherman, the Democrat in the U.S. House from California, who said, that we can't trust uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia with a bone saw. How can we trust them with nuclear weapons? Well, you actually, uh, <laughs> it's ironic you mentioned Brad Sherman. He is he represents the district that I'm sitting in right now out here in in in, uh, in Southern California. So we're talking with three great nuclear experts: Jim Green talking to us from um, uh, Australia with Friends of the Earth, Paul Gunter, and uh, Kevin Camps. Um, in, uh, in the mainland United States here, both from beyond nuclear. Um, and uh, we're, we're starting off with the good news, which is the uh, demise, apparent demise, of the uh, small modular reactor um, uh, technology. But, you know, as Paul mentioned, uh, these guys, uh, they don't go for just subsidies. They go, they go for an umbilical cord. I mean, Jim Green, <clears throat> um, you know, we, we, we're learning here, we've learned or we've known for a long time, that the nuclear power industry is not subject in general to market forces, that it's protected by a so-called regulatory agency that lets them do whatever they want and risks the public health in any way, shape, or form that they can get away with, and that when these uh, reactors uh, don't pay in the marketplace, uh, they, their owners just go to the legislatures now um, and to the federal government, of course. So um, do you see small modules? You, you've written an obituary for this, this technology, but we've written obituaries for uh, nuclear power, you know, periodically over the decades. And, uh, they, I mean, do you see the possibility that small module, modular reactors could be getting huge government bailouts and, and they'll, they'll push ahead with them? Well, it's, it's an absolute possibility uh, you look at subsidies that have been given for large reactors. So in the U.S., there were several billion dollars in subsidies for the uh, for the two Westinghouse reactors in South Carolina before that project went belly up. Several billion dollars of subsidies for the Vogel project in Georgia, which is still going ahead. Uh, you know, if a small, if the SMR, small modular reactor industry, could get hold of several billion dollars, that would at least get them off to a start, and they could build a demonstration reactor or two. Um, so we need to be wary of that. I think, of course, one of the reasons that the federal government is unlikely to give both sorts of subsidies to 
small reactors is that they've just got their hands so badly burnt through subsidies for large reactors and uh, those AP1000 projects have demonstrated yet again the industry's inability to bring projects in on time and on budget. But I think at the moment there's no indication that the SMR industry will get those multi-billion dollar subsidies, but it is possible. And the uh, industry is lobbying furiously uh, and persistently to get those sort of subsidies. So, you know, we can't just celebrate this obituary because there is a fight still going on and it's a little bit of wishful thinking in calling it an obituary. We still really do have to keep fighting this. And for there's an interesting article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. It's written by four scientists who are sympathetic to the nuclear industry and sympathetic to the idea of getting these SMRs up and running. But they just couldn't make the economics work. They've, they've thought of all sorts of different ways you could uh, get an SMR industry up and running and how it might be paid for and how you might use these reactors for uh, not only for electricity production but also for heat generation and for various other purposes. But they couldn't come up with a viable economic scenario for SMRs and they said that uh, to get a to establish and sustain and sustain an SMR industry, you would need several hundred billion dollars of subsidies over the coming decades. So that would be a level of support that uh, even the large nuclear industry has has not really been uh, a beneficiary of. So, yeah, I think um, it's, it's, we do have to keep fighting this. There's no doubt about that. Paul Gunter, what do you think? I think that, uh, again, you know, since 1953, we've known that uh, government and industry um, see this as a, as a marriage. And the, that, uh, again, it's about co-generating electricity for, uh, from a, uh, a weapons production process. And um, th- this is the concern um, th- that Jim has outlined uh, quite uh, illustriously in the um, in the article. That uh, uh, you know they're looking for uh, a proliferation, uh, essentially in um, uh, the Middle East right now, uh, where. Uh, you know, is the le- one of the last places that we want to see nuclear materials introduced. Um, it, it, so, uh, you know, these are big concerns. Um, cost uh, it has always been seen as something to be pushed off on um, the uh, the public, and um, its consequences uh, are not only the threat of nuclear weapons, but a, a proliferation of nuclear waste that will be pushed off on future generations without one watt of benefit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, Kevin? Well, another form of nuclear waste, so to speak, besides radioactive waste, is this waste of money. And I just wanted to give a few details. Uh, Jim mentioned Vogel, Units 3 and 4 in Georgia, uh, the nuclear new build. That's not going well at all, like Paul said, way behind schedule by years way over budget. We're talking uh, a doubling of the price tag, if not tripling over time. And uh, so in that case, we mentioned Ernest Moniz earlier, Obama's energy secretary, who approved a $8.3 billion with a B federal taxpayer-backed nuclear loan guarantee back in the year 2014 for these two new uh, reactors only to have the Trump administration come in and out of nowhere with no process whatsoever uh, approve another $3.7 billion for the same project and nuclear loan guarantees. So uh, an even, what's that, is it $12 billion altogether? And that latter one, the Trump one, involved um, not Trump draining the swamp, but Trump unleashing a radioactive swamp monster. His name is uh, Jeff Miller. He ran uh, now Energy Secretary rick perry's uh campaigns for president and when trump came into power uh this uh, radioactive swamp monster got busy turned into an energy lobbyist uh teamed up with southern nuclear and got this loan guarantee approved overnight out of nowhere and the thing about nuclear loan guarantees is if uh vogel three and four go belly up and there's a very good chance that they will never generate electricity 
and will just be canceled like what happened at the summer, Units 2 and 3 in South Carolina, that entire um, nuclear loan guarantee is lost to the U.S. Treasury. And that amounts to 22 times the amount of money that was lost to the U.S. Treasury in the Solyndra Solar default. The Republican Party made a lot of noise about Solyndra Solar um, going bankrupt, going out of existence, but they've supported the nuclear loan guarantees. So the radioactive swamp monsters and the hypocrisy are pretty thick. It's unbelievable. It's just mind-boggling to hear all this stuff go down. So let's get let's get. I know Paul, you've you've got to jump off. And I don't want to keep you, but I, I do want to get into now um, uh, the uh, the nightmare uh, of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission just uh, rubber stamping every one of these incredibly dangerous projects. You know, there's this big dialogue going on. Um, nuclear uh, as uh, for global warming and all this garbage, and they keep um, uh, rubber stamping these old reactors into further operations. But they never talk about the fact, you know, it's always a, an abstract argument of nuclear power and, and blah, 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 and they never talk about the realities of the physical reactors. Um, and you just mentioned to me prior to coming on, the Seabrook, uh, well, tell us, tell us about the latest developments in Seabrook, if you would, Paul Gunter. Right. Well, you know, given the fact that um, there is no future in new reactor construction, uh, you know, we've just seen the collapse of the Renaissance, they, as they called it. Uh, you know, from the uh, uh, 2006, there was this big plan. Um, there were something like uh, 30 new units proposed in the United States, and those have all but been canceled or um, uh, uh, withdrawn, um, uh, except for the two that Kevin mentioned at, at Vogel uh, 3 and 4 in Georgia. So, um you know the the initial construction phase, the supposed renaissance. Um, these were all re-imaging of the of a failed industry, and now they're proposing um, a uh, 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 to build new reactors for uh, to uh, as carbon free, which which of course they're not. They they all have a nuclear fuel chain uh, that has carbon emissions as well as radioactive emissions all along the way at every link. But the um, the concern is is that the the industry is now uh, again they're just they're just able to continue to lumber forward um, the, and and the way they're proposing that now the bridge to the future is relicensing uh, so that an original forty year license. Um, you know, the 75 to 80 percent of the current industry here in the United States uh, of the you know, have have been uh, have had their 40 license, a 40 year license extended by 20 years. Uh, Seabrook is the latest now to extend uh, to get a 20 year license extension. Um, you know, essentially on the um, uh, the, the anniversary of uh, Fukushima, they gave. Uh, this uh, nuclear power station an additional 20 years. Uh, but it doesn't even stop there. The industry is looking, looking to push uh, beyond uh, 60 years, and now we're fighting um, a license extension, a second license extension from 60 to 80 years. But, uh, you know, uh, this megalomania that we're dealing with they, you know, they're in the formative stages of, of even proposing 80 to 100 years for these same reactors. Um, and, and again, it's because uh, the, 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 there is no economy um, either to uh, the scale offered by large reactors or building these uh, mega factories without orders for the small modular reactors. But if if governments are controlling the um, the agenda, and if um, the regulatory agencies like 
the NRC, what they really stand for is nuclear regulatory capture. Uh, th- this industry will continue to push its danger and its threat of annihilation and extinction onto not only our generation, but future generations. God, it's, it's just unbelievable. Uh, Jim Green, and then we'll get to Kevin. Uh, do you want to describe any of the – well, actually, Paul, I know you've got to run, so – let me get you. Let me let you get this in, and then I'll let you go. Uh, what are some of the physical uh, defects in the? I mean, these old reactors that makes this decision to prolong their life even more dangerous. I know all three of you guys are, are driving cars that are thirty and forty years old. What's the equivalency with these nuclear reactors? Well, you know, given the fact that. Uh, the technology has this incredibly harsh operational uh, environment. Radiation, extreme heat, extreme pressure, uh, fatigue, all kind, you know, cr- cr- uh, corrosion and cracking. Um, you know, and you you can't, you know, given their economy, they're they're reducing the inspections and maintenance and surveillance of just the material condition of these aging facilities. Uh, you know, they're relying upon. Um, you know, it's a little like driving that car you reference through your rearview mirror. You don't really anticipate or know or can accurately assess. Uh, how aging, uh, how, you know, the dangers and hazards that lie in front of us with an industry that is deteriorating materially. It's concrete, for example, at Seabrook. Uh, the foundation of the, that Seabrook nuclear power station is built on is crumbling under um, the same degradation that's causing concrete to disintegrate in our bridge uh, infrastructure here in the United States. That is actively at work in the um, of the U.S. nuclear power stations, and it's it's particularly noted in in Seabrook itself, where um, it can collapse. Um, you know, the the the, stru- the foundation, the structure of the of the spent fuel pool that holds uh, hundreds of tons of nuclear waste is deteriorating, and you can't really get in there and do anything like constructive, uh, destructive analysis. So they are, uh, they're relying on uh, computer-generated formulas to say everything's okay, folks, just let us keep on rolling. And um, so, again, um, <clears throat> we're about as safe with that kind of plan as you would be driving your car through your rearview mirror. You can't rely on looking at things as, as, um, as, as they as they have happened, when you don't really understand the origin of cracking and how quick those cracks can grow into the into future failure. God, thanks, Harvey, right for having me on. I'm going to Thank take you, off Paul. right Thank now. Paul no Paul nukes from Beyond Nuclear. Thank you. Thank you for having, being with us, uh, Kevin Camps. You're an expert on um, on Davis Bessie. Um, uh, tell us um, some of the. I mean, and they're talking now about <clears throat> bailing out Davis Bessie with uh, hundreds of millions of uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to keep it going, uh, and they talk about it as if it's some shiny new nuclear, and the whole debate is nuclear power versus whatever. But uh, the fact is that uh, there's <laughs> some little problems with Davis Bessie. Can you describe the structural defects at this uh, elderly? When did Davis Bessie open? Uh, Kevin. Uh, Davis Bessie began operating in 1977, and it's a twin design to Three Mile Island Unit 2. And a year and a half before the meltdown at TMI near Harrisburg, Davis Bessie had a precursor incident. And fortunately for Northern Ohio, somebody came on shift. He was a nuclear Navy trained nuclear engineer, and he identified what was going on, and they were able to avert the meltdown at Davis Bessie a year and a half earlier. But then they covered up the incident. They didn't want the public to find out. They didn't want uh, the media to find out. So they didn't even communicate secretly within the industry to avert the meltdown that then happened at Three Mile Island. And we're coming up on the 40th year mark on March 28th of that meltdown. 
But in addition to that, you know, inherent risk at these nuclear plants, even when they're brand new, like they were decades ago, there's age-related degradation. And at davis uh like Paul was talking about Seabrook, there's a different form of concrete cracking. It involves the shield building, which is the last line of defense. It's a part of the containment around the reactor. And they have severe cracking at davis Bessey that probably dates back to 1978, if the company's to be believed, but it wasn't detected, supposedly, until 2011. And despite the severe cracking of the containment, which, by the way, grows worse by a half inch every time it freezes and thaws at davis Bessey, which is a lot of times every year, uh, not in the summer, but in the spring, in the autumn, and in the winter, there are freeze-thaw cycles, so the cracking is getting worse and worse. And it's so bad that the company actually admitted to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that they could have large chunks of concrete spall off the exterior face of this giant uh, shield building and crash down to the ground. And wouldn't you know, there are safety-significant systems, structures, and components located below this potentially spalling concrete. So in that sense, technically speaking, a concrete collapse on the exterior face could initiate a meltdown. It could take out a safety system, cause a meltdown, and then the containment will not hold in the radioactivity that's escaping in the meltdown. So those are the risks. And even though they admitted that to the NRC, the NRC still rubber-stamped a 20-year license extension. So instead of shutting down on Earth Day in 2017, Davis Bessie is good to go, at least according to the NRC, until Earth Day of 2037. My God. When is the last time that Davis Bessie was tested for embrittlement? Well, probably a very long time ago. I don't know the exact answer, but what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has done on the embrittlement of the reactor pressure vessel, this is a neutron-induced uh, micro-cracking that could lead to catastrophic failure of reactor pressure vessels is they've loosened the rules. They've weakened the regulations. In fact, the Associated Press post-Fukushima did a major expose on uh, aging nukes, they called it. And their top example of NRC regulatory retreat was on this pressurized thermal shock reactor pressure vessel embrittlement question. So one issue, and I don't know that this is the case at davis Bessey, but it is at Palisades in Michigan, which is very likely the worst embrittled reactor pressure vessel in the country on the Lake Michigan shore, they have run out of what are called coupons. These are samples of metal that they look at from time, or they're supposed to, to see how bad the embrittlement is in the reactor pressure vessel. So Palisades, now approaching 50 years in operation, has essentially run out of metal coupons. They never planned to operate it this long. They have one left, and their justification for not pulling it and seeing how bad the embrittlement is is because they only have one left. And if they pull it, they won't have any more left, and they could never look again. So incredibly, we're just sailing ever deeper into uncharted territories of risk on just this one issue, but it's an important one. Like Paul mentioned, uh, 69 pressurized water reactors, it's a bit less now because of some shutdowns in the U.S., all vulnerable to this issue, some way worse than others, and one of the worst in the country is right there uh, in California at Diablo Canyon Unit 1, and they're not looking there either. It's a nightmare. Jim Green, do you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, well, if we, can bring, if we can tie the issues together, the, the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and small modular reactors, or SMRs, the only way the SMRs could possibly fly is if they get all sorts of outrageous exemptions and privileges from the NRC to lessen the safety standards uh, because by lessening the safety standards you can improve the economics. So I think that's really the crux of this debate over SMRs and the crux of the, the political debate and where the political opposition should be because the NRC has already indicated that they're more than happy to go down this path of weakening safety standards in order to improve the economics. Uh, one example there is how large does the buffer zone have to be around an SMR, and it should be pretty much the same as for a large reactor, but the NRC, NRC has ruled otherwise, and that has implications for safety, but also security as well. I mean, if your buffer zone is more or less non-existent, we've got no buffer to s separate the reactor from 
anyone who would uh, deliberately inflict damage on it. So it's a really important issue and one that really needs to be explored a lot more and, and needs to be fought against. And uh, there's an important report written by the Union of Concerned Scientists in 2013, but it could have been written yesterday. It's still very fresh. And it's called Small Isn't Always Beautiful. And it goes through these safety issues and even more so the security issues, and it's well worth a read. Well, what are um, um, uh, some of these uh, safety issues and security issues? I mean, let's get some detail here. Um, we know, uh, Kevin Camps, for example, that um, all um, uh, reactors uh, uh, that are operating in the United States are, of course, embrittled. Um, um, uh, and, and, Jim, I don't know if you know, uh, have you followed the technicalities of the embrittlement issue? Either one of you. Well, uh, for myself on small modular reactors, I have not, but I would just point out, as I mentioned earlier, that Three Mile Island, uh, also Chernobyl, uh, were pretty much brand new reactors, and what happened was a surprise to the designers and the operators. There were flaws in the design that crept up on them and surprised them. And uh, just in recent days, uh, Three Mile Island alert, and again, the 40th anniversary of the meltdown is coming up at the end of this month introduced a objection on extended operations at Three Mile Island Unit 1, still operating, that has to do with defects, flaws in brand new replacement steam generators, which are safety significant systems at, at that reactor that uh, could lead to um, loss of coolant accident, could lead to meltdown, could lead to catastrophic radioactivity release again at Three Mile Island. So sometimes they just screw up. I mean, they work the bugs out in, in a very bad way with uh, nuclear accidents. So that would be kind of a warning for small modular reactors. Um, is, uh, Jim, is embrittlement an issue with a small modular reactor? Yeah, absolutely. I can't really see why there would be any difference there uh, comparing small reactors and large reactors. It will definitely be an issue. The only obvious caveat there is that these small modular reactors don't exist. It's just uh, fairy tale stuff at the moment. But if they are built, you will have pretty much the same set of issues you have with large reactors. Okay, so let's jump into another territory here. Um, and I'm Jim. I, I don't know if you've been following this, but two major utility companies in the United States which are operating uh, commercial atomic power plants are in bankruptcy. Now, we've just had a big uh, go-round here in California uh, trying to get the bankruptcy court, and we're not done. Uh, we had a window of opportunity which shut, um, which is that the uh, nuclear plant at Diablo Canyon was shut for refueling. We uh, uh, collected a major petition uh, got some very important people to sign on. We went to the governor. Uh, we're going now to the state legislature. And um, uh, we want these uh, reactors to be subjected, uh, the, well, the two reactors at Diablo Canyon to be inspected, uh, subjected to inspection um, uh, within the bankruptcy. And, um, uh, Kevin, uh, the same is true of First Energy, which owns the four reactors at Davis Bessey, Perry, uh, and the two at Beaver Valley. Has there been any chance or any motion at all under bankruptcy to circumvent the power of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to um, uh, prevent any public uh, scrutiny on, on uh, embrittlement and on other structural defects? Well, Kevin, uh, have you had a very look intriguing at that? idea, Harvey. I, I'd have to say that the uh, the bulk of the time of the grassroots environmental movement in northern Ohio has been in trying to stop these bailouts that have been uh, attempted by First Energy for many long years now. Only now we're facing probably the most strenuous strenuous effort yet. They've got a lot of traction in the Ohio State Legislature. They've had um, President Trump's and Energy Secretary Perry's ear for a couple years now because that radioactive swamp monster I mentioned earlier, uh, Jeff Miller, who used to be a top staffer of Perry's, uh, works for First Energy, too, not just for Southern Nuclear at Bogle. 
And so uh, he got Trump on board. Uh, you know, there's all this talk right now of Trump's emergency powers to appropriate funding to build a wall on the Mexican border. Well, you know what he tried a year, year and a half ago was to employ those same emergency powers to subsidize old nukes and old coal plants in the U.S. to the tune of $17 billion each per year, $34 billion altogether for dirty, dangerous, and expensive energy uh, age-degraded plants. And they're perhaps going to try that again now that they've loaded the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, including the Department of Energy lawyer who wrote the attempted emergency powers to subsidize uh, nukes and coal. So both at the federal level and at the state level, we've been um, maxed out fighting those subsidies. But um, like you say, uh, First Energy is in bankruptcy it's still a tremendous opportunity. They keep threatening to shut their reactors. We say we wish you would. But what they use that as a leverage point is to say, hey, all these jobs are going to go away, all these tax revenues. And what they do is they whip the local public into a frenzy that cities are going to go bankrupt for lack of tax revenues. All these workers are going to be thrown out on the street. We push back and say, hey, there's so much potential for renewables in Ohio, for God's sake, wind and solar, that that's the economy of the future anyway. Why not just go there? And then in terms of the workforce, yes, a just transition is needed. And there's a lot of cleanup during the decommissioning, during the dismantlement. They're going to have to clean up a lot of radioactive mess that they themselves have made. And they also have to safeguard the high-level radioactive waste that has nowhere to go. So... There's a lot of common sense solutions, and instead they're doing the exact opposite, or they're trying to. Well, uh, Kevin, uh, 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 Jim, Jim, yeah, please. Yeah, uh, I think Mid American Energy is an interesting case study here. It's uh, a subsidiary of a, a Warren Buffett owned company. Um, so we're talking about smart money here, and. Mid American was looking to build an SMR in Iowa, and they were looking to use legislation which would force ratepayers to pay in advance for the reactors, even if they were never completed. So they were going down that path, but they never got that legislation, so they gave up on their SMR project. But meanwhile, Mid Mid American invested over $10 billion in renewables in Iowa. And that's had a real effect. Wind power has gone up to 38% and coal's gone down from 76% to 45%. So already significant improvement in the uh, electricity mix in Iowa. And Mid-American is now looking towards uh, 100% renewables, perhaps not as fast as we would like them to, but they're going down that path. And I think that's the one and only thing that really breaks the nexus here when you've got communities that have been heavily dependent on jobs from the nuclear industry and, and have been so for decades, well, how do you break that that cycle? And the answer is renewables, which are vastly cheaper than nuclear now. There's no question about that. And are definitely the um, energy source of the future. So that's the way we can, we can get out of the mess that we're currently in. Well, Jim Green, what has been the uh, public uh, response to the uh, proliferation of wind in Iowa. You know, you hear all this crap from the uh, uh, industry hypesters about bird kills and people complaining about windmills and um, uh, uh, energy uh, prices going up. What has been the actual experience of the people of Iowa with this shift to wind power from nuclear and from coal. I'm not familiar with uh, the situation in Iowa in that much detail, Harvey, but obviously there's a whole lot more jobs there as opposed to the phantom jobs that never eventuated because of the interest in, in, in reactors, small or large. So, I mean, that would be the most significant fact. And, uh, you know, we're going through the similar thing in Australia as well. We don't have nuclear power reactors here, so it's about the transition from fossil fuels to renewables. But, you know, when the economics are so favourable for renewables, well, nothing's going to stop it. It's just happening whether the politicians like it or not. And we've got a a crazy right-wing government here in Australia that's trying to put the brakes on renewables and trying to 
support new coal-fired power plants, but the economics just don't stack up. So that's going to be the outcome of this scenario. You know, whether the, the right-wingers like it or not, which they don't, and whether we like it or not, which we do, we're, we're just, uh, we've got a renewable energy revolution and it's happening and global renewable uh, electricity generation has doubled over the past years and costs have plummeted and that's just going to keep on going. You have a big uh, battery project going in Australia with Elon Musk. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's not all that big, actually. It was sold as being the biggest battery in the world, which was true, but it's still pretty tiny. It's uh, 100 megawatt hours, so, you know, if you get a, a significant blackout, it's only going to make a small difference to that. Uh, but it plays what they call ancillary services, so it helps to maintain the stability and the frequency of, of the grid, and uh, it helps to undercut some of the price gouges in the markets. Uh, and it's just been hugely effective, whichever way you measure it. Uh, it's been effective for Elon Musk in that it's turned a profit. It's been effective for South Australian ratepayers who have seen their bills go down, if only marginally, but they've certainly gone down because of this battery. And uh, we've also got pumped hydro projects in Australia, so we're moving ahead reasonably fast on all fronts The all different sorts of renewables, plus pumped hydro storage, plus battery storage, plus a massive take-up of rooftop solar. Wow. Now, you mentioned in, in Iowa, and Kevin, are you, have you been following the situation in Iowa? Yeah, I was just out there in October. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us, tell us what you saw. Well, I was hosted by Mike Carberry of Green State Solutions, who had a big hand in blocking Warren Buffett's lobbyists uh, from securing that public bailout for small modular reactors, and he worked with uh, ARP, the Retired Persons Association, and many other uh, creative allies who would all, you know, have been harmed by that. And I just would report that Iowans are thrilled at the uh, expansion of wind power. And uh, the reason I was out there is because, ironically enough, because of its geographic location in the United States, and they do have the, the Dwayne Arnold nuclear power plant, which thankfully is going to shut next year and uh, close down. But they will catch a lot of the mobile Chernobyl shipments from the eastern half of the country uh, of high-level radioactive waste flowing out to these western dump sites that are proposed, Yucca Mountain, Nevada, on western Shoshone Indian land, or the uh, Holtec in New Mexico, the centralized interim storage facility uh, I mentioned earlier in the show. And there's another one called Interim Storage Partners, uh, at the Waste Control Specialist site in Texas. The two uh, centralized interim storage facilities are but 40 miles apart from each other, and it's in a Hispanic area that's already heavily polluted by the fossil fuel industry and the nuclear industry, uranium enrichment, uh, military plutonium disposal, uh, low-level radioactive waste disposal from the nuclear power industry. So it's a tremendous environmental injustice what's being proposed, and uh, that's another upside of renewables is you don't have these uh, just uh, terrible environmental injustices associated with them. Wow. So um, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Jim Green, and we're almost, almost at the end here. Uh, Jim Green, if you'll identify yourself and tell people how to get a hold of you, that'd be great. What was that? Sorry, Happy. If you'll identify yourself and tell people how to get a hold of you, we're almost at the end of the show. It's been really, really interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah. if anyone wants to get in, in contact, um, I'm the National Nuclear Campaigner with Friends of the Earth Australia, so find me via the FOE website and the editor of the Nuclear Monitor newsletter, and once again, that's online and pretty easy to find. So, yeah, happy to be contacted by anyone who wants more information. And Kevin Camps? Yeah, I'm, I am the radioactive waste specialist, and Paul Gunter is the reactor oversight project director at Beyond Nuclear, and our website is just beyondnuclear.org. Okay, so Jim, uh, so where we get somebody from Australia, um, is there a strong, I know you've got a right-wing government, as you mentioned, but that coal is not, is that coal mined in Australia that you burn, and what's the general feeling about transitioning away from coal? since, thank God, you don't have nuclear. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, it is mined in Australia. We mine uh, more than enough coal for uh, Australia's current needs and a whole lot more besides. So Australia is one of the biggest coal exporters. As I said, we've got a crazy right-wing government, but, you know, we've got history on our side and uh, today there's going to be tens of thousands of students wagging school and going to climate protests all around Australia in 60 different towns and cities. And uh, they're right on board with this renewable energy transition and they know how corrupt the politicians are and they know how hypocritical and duplicitous these companies are with all their talk about so-called clean coal. So there really is a tidal wave of, of momentum to make this transition happen and to make it happen quickly. And Jim, have you had any cooperation from the unions? Is there any movement on the a part of the union movement to unionize the solar industry and to become a pro-solar force? Well, it's mixed. There are some unions which are just fantastic and they've really been great in supporting our anti-nuclear campaigns and pro-renewables and understand the need to transition out of fossil fuels as quickly as we possibly can. But there are others that are dinosaurs that are still wedded to the coal industry. Uh, so all I can say is that it's just it's mixed. There's no single response from the trade union industry, from the trade unions. Kevin, what's been your response, your your experience in the U.S. here with the uh, with the labor unions? Yeah, there, it's mixed here too. Uh, one success story was the uh, Diablo Canyon shutdown agreement. Uh, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers was a signatory to the shutdown agreement. So there's hope. There's the work of Sierra Club and uh, labor. It's called the Blue Green Alliance that goes back more than a decade at this point. So there's real hope. And I mentioned in northern Ohio and the rest of Ohio, there's a tremendous renewable energy uh, manufacturing base there. And ironically enough, the state legislature and even the governor have just kind of uh, ignored it to the point of blocking wind in Ohio. So we just got to keep working across whatever uh, obstacles or barriers they try to throw in our way. And, you know, the Green New Deal in the U.S. is a tremendous opportunity for environmentalists and labor to uh, to work together. Well, it's shocking to me that none of the uh, unions from those um, um, wind component factories have come forward to fight the bailout of the nuclear plant. I mean, there's been a, just this giant chasm in the Midwest uh, between the union movement, which is locked in, apparent, part, parts of it are locked into coal and nuclear, and the uh, upcoming bonanza in wind. There's a complete disconnect. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been devastating to the environment and devastating to the, uh, uh, to the desperately needed shutdown, movements to shut down these nuclear plants. And um, well, you know, maybe we until we can help jump that Tony gap, Mazzotti I don't know. Thank you, guys. Oh, Jim Green, Adam, Kevin Camps, Paul Gunter. Thank you so much. It's been really, we really evolve? interesting. We'll be back again next week in Solar Either Tokyo. Way, Thanks to the crew in New York. And keep the faith, people. The it's a long haul. On the Garden of Eden. Don't you know we're going to have a Solartopia, Solartopia, Solartopia. Don't you know?